Um, I would like to welcome everybody to today's uh, CISIAC webinar, webinar titled, Is the Two-Week Agile Sprint the Worst Software Idea Ever? Subtitled, Management Issues in Software Assurance and Information Security. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC, uh, or the Cybersecurity and, and Information <coughs> Systems Information Analysis Center. Uh, our presenter today is Garish Seshagiri, who I will introduce in a few minutes. But before we begin, I have a few uh, administrative comments to make. Um, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. However, you, uh, you can uh, ask questions and, and we encourage you to ask questions uh, during the presentation by entering them through either the Q&A pane or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Um, we will answer questions uh, at the end of the presentation today. Uh, the presentation will last between 45 and 50 minutes, and we'll have 10 to 15 minutes of uh, time to um, ask the presenters uh, the questions. I will ask. The, I will be collecting the questions, and I will, uh, and I will be asking the questions at the end. Um, one of the most frequent questions asked is about copies of the slides, and um, after the presentation is over, copies of the slides will be available. Um, if you'd like a copy, uh, please send me a request. You can see my email address there on the, on the screen at, right now. Uh, we're also recording this event, so the video audio, if you will, uh, the video of the, the slides and the audio will be posted, and, and we will distribute a link once it is posted. Now, to begin today's presentation, let me just give a, a very brief overview about the CISIAC. Um, you know, as I've mentioned before, please note my email address for any questions that you might have. But the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse of information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management. Uh, the CISIAC is operated by a small company by the name of Quantarian Solutions, and that's who I work for. And it's funded through the Department of Defense's Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTEC. Um, I would encourage you to uh, check out our website and join our community of practice um, at www.thecisiac.com, as you can see at the top of the screen. Also, we have a couple of discussion groups on LinkedIn. Um, one is referred to as CISIAC Software Intensive Systems, and the other one is CISIAC Information Assurance. All right, so that, that's a bit of an overview. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our presenter, first of all. Uh, Garish, uh, who is the CEO of Advanced Information Services Incorporated, or AIS, is a globally recognized subject matter expert and thought leader in software assurance, software quality management, software process improvement, and modern methods of managing knowledge work. He is a reputed conference speaker, coach, and instructor. He's the executive sponsor of AIS's continuous process improvement, resulting in, in the company receiving IEEE's Computer Society Software Process Achievement Award, and he's achieved CMMI Level 5 certification. Um, a little bit of breaking news here is that uh, last evening, Garish's company, uh, AIS, was also the winner of ISC Squared's 2013 Government Information Security Leadership Award, within the federal contractors category. So congratulations to AIS on that. Um, let's see. Uh, Garish is the author uh, of the white paper, Emerging Cyber Threats Call for a Change in the Deliver Now, Fix Later Culture of Software Development. Um, and Garish has an MBA in marketing from Michigan State University. So at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Garish. Um, please proceed, Garish. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Tom, and uh, thanks all for attending. And also thanks to the uh, men and women of AIS for the great work you do. And from you, I learn every day. Congratulations on the uh, Gisela Award uh, you received last night. Um, I got an e email the other day from a friend, and she said that she heard about a webinar on Agile, and I said, well, send me the details I'd like to attend. And she replied back saying, it's your webinar. Well, uh, my friend, this webinar is not about Agile. It is really is, I put the question in the title to get your attention, now that you're here, 
I can tell you that this webinar is about the management issues and software application development, app dev in short, uh, with reference to software assurance and information security. I will talk about Agile and Agile Sprints as well as about CMMI in the larger context of how to manage the software technical work. And I picked CMMI and Agile because we are, as you can see, and as Tom said, appraised at CMMI Maturity Level 5 since 2007, and we practice Agile incremental delivery, which we call our high-velocity development method. So here's the summary of what I'm going to say. I want to say that we have persistence problems in software engineering that we've not been able to solve. We have very good methods such as CMMI and Agile, but we're implementing them as quick fix solutions. Instead, I'm proposing that we pay attention to what I'm going to present to you today are the, uh, the immutable laws of software development. And then I'll present, if you're still with me, uh, seven specific transformational principles and action items. Uh, I think we're all agreed that software is the most exciting of all technologies today. And without software, we won't have the standard of living that we have today. And I have managed software teams for a very long time, and I wouldn't want to be working in any other field. And yet, managing software applications development continues to be a, a challenge. And we're faced with uh, persistent problems in software engineering. And number one is that it's now becoming more and more apparent that defective software is the single biggest contributor to the uh, increasing number of targeted cyber attacks. Uh, and if you look at uh, how we're doing large-scale enterprise resource planning projects and modernizing legacy systems, we seem to have more failures than successes in terms of cost, schedule, and quality performance. And then if you closely observe where our software teams are spending their time in a software application development project, you find that they're spending most of their time in finding and fixing bugs. And for those of us that come from a manufacturing background, we would call it scrap and rework. And in no other industry can you survive with 60% of your cost in scrap and rework, but we do that in software. And, and I think you can also see that our development teams are invariably working to meet uh, what are unrealistic and arbitrary scheduled deadlines. And they try to do their best and most of the time end up delivering what they can by the committed deadline and not necessarily with very good quality, leading to what I'm calling this whole culture of deliver it now or fix it later. And we have had some success <clears throat> with methods, but they don't seem to scale to not large systems, but even medium-sized systems. And if you think about it, uh, software work is done by individuals working in teams. And there is enormous variation in individual productivity and also productivity of an individual from day to day. And yet we have to meet these hard deadlines without fully understanding the impact of the variation in productivity on cost, schedule, and, and quality. And, and then our developers and our teams have very little say in matters that affect them and the success of the project. Things such as how long should a project take? What development strategy should we use? What process should we follow? Is the product ready to go live on the committed date? What do we need to do to get back on schedule? These things, they don't get a whole lot to say in those types of things. And I call this absence of workplace democracy, uh, not respecting the individual, all of which leads to absence of uh, joint work. So that's my list of uh, software engineering's persistent problems. And let me just talk a little bit about cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Uh, as you can see here, <clears throat> there's the exponential rise in these cybersecurity vulnerabilities through second half of 2010, the latest published data that I could find. And it's a very serious matter. Our SecDef has said that <clears throat> this is a national security crisis. Uh, the next Pearl Harbor we confront could be a cyber attack that cripples our power systems, our grids, security systems, financial systems, and governmental systems. Serious stuff. And it's been around for a long time. This is 2005 when the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee said that vulnerabilities in software that are introduced by mistake or poor practices are a serious problem. In 2013, software managers and developers have yet to come to grips with the secure programming techniques and processes necessary to permanently reduce the number of vulnerabilities. 
despite massive investments, they're still here and there are lots of them. And, and if you see what's alarming is 70% of today's applications contain known vulnerabilities. And we've known these, about these vulnerabilities for quite some time and excellent work done by say a Homeland Security and US CERT and so on. And yet 70% failed that and, and SQL injection errors, 32% uh, of the applications still contain SQL injection errors, something we've known for a long time. So what have we been doing about these problems? And if you want to know what we've been doing, we just need to take a look at where, our, where we're spending our money in what I would call the, the growth industries. And here you see the list. Information assurance is a very big business now, uh, IA as we call it. Certification and accreditation, these are people that will analyze what you're doing and tell you if you're complying with FISMA and FedRAMPs and things of that nature. Uh, testing has been around for a long time as an industry in terms of education, seminars, and tools, test automation tools. Uh, we're seeing a growing emergence of static code analyzer uh, industry, the people that are writing code that will analyze our code to see if there's vulnerabilities in it. And then we have the old standbys, the, the organizations that award uh, certificates, uh, like Project Management Institutes, so PMP, ITIL, and uh, the two that I'm most familiar with, uh, this from Carnegie Mellon's CMMI and the Agile Scrum, uh, the Agile Scrum methods. So the, the question, I guess, we, and, and by the way, by this is what you would call the app application security industry. So this is AppSec, and my estimate is that it's probably now as big or bigger than AppDev, and also there are some estimates saying that this is now all trending towards about a trillion dollars. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we getting our money's worth? <clears throat> So let me just talk about CMMI and Agile uh, and, and to illustrate the, the problems that we're having. Uh, and CMMI, as most of you probably know, is the most widely used software process improvement and appraisal method. And there's more than 3,500 companies in about 100 countries around the world that use it. And it is somewhat of a de facto good housekeeping seal for software and systems development and services. And it does a good job of defining what an effective process looks like. It doesn't prescribe the how-to details of the process, and it's intended to be used as a model to base process improvements in an evolutionary way and periodically assess where the organization's processes are in that evolution. And it's sort of like a plan, do, check, act way of continuous improvement, and it works. Uh, organizations use it to document an official process to be used by all the projects, and the way they can enforce repeatability and get predictable results. Um, and it's also been very helpful in stabilizing an organization and getting some amount of control over the work uh, that's being done. And, and it, its biggest benefit is that it provides the foundation needed for real improvement. And the five-level model, uh, which and this has been true for our, in our experience, is when you get to when, when we got to level five is when we really understood how we do what we do and what are some of the relationships, the cost and effect and so on that impacts cost, schedule and quality in our projects. And so we can start to begin the process of improving it at that point. And so in that sense, what we're saying is level five is the beginning and not the end. Unfortunately, that's how it's actually been viewed and, and treated. <clears throat> Uh, let's also take a look at the uh, impact of <clears throat> these CMMI levels on quality, and this is data from Capers Jones. And, and what you see here on the left column are the various CMMI levels, and the rightmost column are the defect density in the delivered products. And this is based on thousands of projects that he analyzed, based on the CMM level of the software project. And, and you can see just looking at uh, and, and, he, and he's measuring these densities per uh, function point, which is a size metric that he uses. And so going from level one to level five, uh, going from level one to level three, we got almost a 10 times improvement in quality in terms of um, the defect density. And going from three to five, we get another three times. So it's almost 30 times improvement from one to five. It's interesting to note that many organizations and acquiring organizations too stop at level three. Somehow there's this notion that getting to 
getting additional quality is going to increase the cost. And again, here again, software is the only industry that sort of takes the position that improving quality means more cost. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the model itself is very good, but I think there are serious issues in the way organizations go about implementing uh, things like CMMI. In many organizations, the only way you can make sure the process is being followed is to rely on artifacts and, and examining them. But the problem is the artifacts are produced by, uh, not by the developers, by the, by the process group people, or what I'm noting here is the organizational bureaucracy. Uh, in fact, in some organizations, they are called as the people that come after the battle and shoot the wounded. And the, the problem here is that the, the artifacts, because they're not produced by the developers, may have no relationship to the actual work being done. So over time, the organizations get good at learning how to pass an appraisal as opposed to doing the hard work of getting the engineers to change the way they're doing and, and do very high quality work. So again, let me emphasize that it is not the problem with the CMMI, but it is a problem with the way it's implemented. So this last point about not changing uh, engineering behavior, it really leads us to the question, the real question, which is whose process is it? So we need to really make sure that the people that are doing the work own the processes and not the, the organizational bureaucracy owning it. So let me talk a little bit about Agile. And I think most of you know that uh, 17 people got together in a resort in Utah and drafted the Agile uh, manifesto many years ago. And what they're trying to look at were this, this problem about large projects being unsuccessful and getting canceled and after spending a lot of money. And the fact that the, the whole software development was in a very highly changing environment, so they asked the question, what's the point of doing planning and tracking? It's uh, to no value because requirements are changing throughout. And what are defects we have? Requirements, defects are the number one reasons uh, projects fail. And if you do a lot of, take a lot of time up front designing it, uh, it is more problematic. So they kind of basically came to the conclusion that, uh, first of all, you need to break the larger projects into smaller Time, uh, time frames to keep delivering stuff and quit doing this waterfall idea of doing requirements, then design, then coding, then testing, and then delivering. So that's sort of the thing, and, and they, 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 very, they very elegantly put this in terms of what is important and what is not important. important. So what's on the right-hand side is less important than what's on the le uh, left-hand side. And they've made it clear that they're not saying that what's on the right is not important individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And they said that we need to be doing, delivering working software as opposed to spending a lot of time and money and pages and documentation, collaborating with customers as opposed to spending a lot of time on negotiating contracts, and responding to changes as opposed to just strictly following a plan. And very good ideas. Uh, and 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 it's got now. I would have to say that it probably agile uh, in its various forms probably has the biggest mind share of all of the methods right now. And as you can see here, the Department of Defense, which is the largest buyer in the world of software systems and, and development and services, uh, is included agile as one of the points in this 10-point plan for IT modernization. And, and again, it has very good uh, principles here. Deliver usable capabilities every six to 12 months with active user involvement and small, dynamic, and empowered teams so that you can do small scope releases that are responsive to changes, as you see here. Those are the releases. And these little circles, uh, you can't read that uh, letter there, it says time bound. So these are, these are what, what are the sprints, and they are, uh, design, they'll be designed to be fixed length, and they will deliver these every so often. All of which is good. The only the one point that, uh, which is what I put in the title, was I am not a great fan of this uh, arbitrarily fixing a time frame for a sprint as two weeks particularly. And I'll illustrate that with an example. Uh, we recently completed a modernization project, and we delivered uh, our team delivered 600,000 lines of code, which was a project that won the award last night. Uh, it was four weeks out of schedule, and there were zero cybersecurity vulnerabilities in 600,000 lines of code when our team delivered it. And if we had said <clears throat> to the team that 
<clears throat> you need to be doing this over two years in two week sprints, they would have to deliver pretty much 12,000 lines of code every two weeks. And the issues that I see with that is that they throw the best because of the two week deadline, they're gonna deliver whatever they have and probably the defect density of the deliver this what is supposed to be working software, in my opinion, will be barely working software. And this is the, 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 the thing is that what happens is then <clears throat> what has got to be fixed is going to get fixed in the next sprint. And, and that's the deliver it now, we'll fix it later syndrome. And, and in the Agile community, we call this technical debt. Now, to me, it looks to me, if, if we have accumulating technical debt, sprint after sprint after sprint, I think that we probably should call it malpractice. In fact, the more I think about it, if we call technical debt malpractice, that's probably the only way we can probably eliminate it. And, and the other issue that I see is that there is a fixed cost in every sprint that you have to start and stop and, and deliver and, and do whatever contractually you have to do and so on. And now we have just made it about 50 times more uh, cost than what we may need to do. And every time we deliver something, the customer has to spend time uh, testing it. And I also suspect, and I've seen it in a couple of uh, large agile teams, but not by no means a, a, a large sample, but these people that are on these two-week treadmills over a two-year period seem to have some serious work-life balance uh, issues. So I'm not a great fan of that. Uh, so so just, just to have some fun at their expense, I'm going to say, Maybe the way Agile's implemented in many organizations, I'll call it Agile Manifesto 2.0, is kind of like this. Uh, they value doing, 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 over planning, doing, checking, and act. Uh, they value guesswork over facts. Uh, they value speed over optimum results. And they, they value accumulating technical debt over institutionalizing discipline approach. And then there's a culture that says, <clears throat> an attitude that says that to the customer, if you want it in the worst way, that's how I'll deliver it. Well, it's just a little attempt to be funny here, but, but what I'm really pointing out seriously is that what you see on the right-hand side are the ones that are important over what is on the left-hand side. That's, so if there is a 2.0, that's how we should probably uh, do that. So essentially the point is that <clears throat> these, these problems persist even though we've invested significant amounts of time and money in these methods, unfortunately we end up not implementing the methods the way we probably should. So what do we have to do going forward? And I'm suggesting that we start thinking about how do we connect the dots between agility, quality, innovation, and joy in work. And the reason is that I think if you think about it, and, and we know now that quality work is more predictable, uh, unhappy people rarely do quality work, and because poor quality impacts schedule and cost and so on, <clears throat> you'll have agility only in name if you don't have quality. And we really should start now seriously thinking about how do we measure and manage quality. It's just not gonna happen. And <clears throat> so if we just keep talking about it without actual numbers, it's just talk. And, and what we really want in our organization is the culture of innovation and we need to strive for environments where people are respected, they have capable of managing themselves because they know and they're, <clears throat> they're, they're aware of their capabilities, they have personal historical data that you use, and they practice agility with discipline. So <clears throat> as one who's been following a lot of these things uh, from people like Dr. Deming, Dr. Drucker, and Watts Humphrey, and I kind of come to the conclusion that what they said during the second half of the 20th century were pretty revolutionary ideas that has helped in, in, in how we do manufacturing, how we manage knowledge work, and how we manage software technical work. And these people, by the way, were prolific uh, writers. They all wrote lots of books, gave lots of talks. And basically, I'll summarize, uh, <laughs> and they all lived for a long time, uh, what they said over that time period in this short uh, bullet points here. Uh, Dr. Deming basically said, look, if you're an organization, you need to have an aim and a purpose more than just to make money and, and give a return to your shareholders, and you need to have a constancy of purpose for that aim. And <clears throat> if, if you have uh, HR policies like incentive compensation and so on, where people have to find <clears throat> uh, re 
rewards to get satisfaction as opposed to actually satisfaction from the job itself, that leads to the destruction of the individual. And he says we ought to be leveraging what people are inherently born with, which is the wanting to do the job the right way with quality and pride of workmanship and remove all the barriers that we have in the way we manage this work that rob people of the pride of workmanship. Uh, Dr. Drucker lived to be about 100 years and uh, wrote a lot about uh, management and, uh, and always predicting what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and in fact, uh, the joke is that he's the only one that could reminisce about the future as he lived for such a long time. And, but even then, at the end of that, he sort of came to the conclusion because the knowledge worker knows more about the job than anybody else in management. So he started asking the question, how can we actually manage when this person knows more, that's the person that knows most about what needs to be done. So, and he stated it this way, one, that one can truly manage another person is by no means adequately proven. And that was kind of an eye-opener for me who had been following him for a long time, and then he said, oh, now he's saying something like that. Uh, one well, who got a PhD from, uh, honorary degree from Embry-Riddle, and, and thought a lot about what happens when these projects fail and what is impacting costs and and he came to the conclusion with a lot of data that poor quality performance is the root cause of most software problems. And he basically said, therefore, quality is more important than schedule. So I think what we need to do is to sort of think about what they said and, and go forward uh, using our methods uh, in terms of what they said. Now let me um, show some data from our projects uh, to reinforce the kinds of things that uh, these uh, gentlemen said. Uh, here's one which is constancy of purpose of our scheduled performance. And you can see constancy of purpose This on the x-axis, it's time. It goes all the way back to 1988. The y-axis, what we're measuring is percent of deviation. In other, words, in other words, what we said we will deliver when we actually delivered it. So plan minus actual over the uh, plan as a percent deviation. And, and that's what you're seeing here. We're not showing the individual data points, but for the first four years, you could see this enormous range of deviation in the, in, in the projects that we were doing. And our average deviation, which is the line in the middle, is about 112%. And then we uh, sponsored an executive sponsorship of a long-term continuous improvement based on the CMM model and that was January 22, 1992, when I talked to Watch Sumfrey, and we started this. And as you can see, over the next four years, we actually squeezed the range down even and brought down the average down to 36.8%. Still not very good. So we introduced the personal software process and the team software process. You can think of those as level five methods for the individual and the team. And you can see dramatically to what happens over the next 10 years. And a much shorter um, range of results, and, a, and the median has also gotten less. And then we put all of this into an agile incremental delivery model uh, called high-velocity development. And you can see that we further reduce it to today, where we can now deliver, uh, on average, with less than 6% of committed schedule. Uh, and I, and I, I don't do the work, but I'm very proud of the people that do the work, and I'm honored to lead them. Uh, so so, so over the, as we got through the CMI level five and, and we were trying to manage with actual data and facts, this is, these are the performance metrics that, that we feel are important. And so on the rows here, you're seeing the actual metrics. And then the two columns are uh, industry average for that, those metrics. And some of this, uh, most of this is hard to come by and not exactly publish results, but most people, when I put present this, have accepted that, and I think this is generally accepted. And I put here a company average, and you can substitute these with your company's averages if you have them. If not, I encourage you to get them because these are the ones that are really important. Uh, I, it's amazing to me that many, many companies that I've talked to cannot produce a chart like this, and uh, that, that sort of amazes to me and everybody should have one of those. Uh, so scheduled deviation is this, this company's average is less than 6%. Industry average is more than 
The other important metric is the density of defects in the delivered product normalized to say 100,000 source lines of code. And in the industry today, average is about 100, one defect per uh, one line of code. And uh, that's with the very high maturity organizations as shown by Capers Jones numbers. If you know how to backfire from function points, you can probably get that same result that I have here. Uh, this company is six times better than that, less than 15 defects per 100,000 source lines of code. And, and because the, the quality uh, customers can get through acceptance testing pretty quickly without a long tail that we usually have in these projects at the end to test and rework, uh, so industry average is more than four months for that. Uh, this company gets there by inspecting 100% of the design and the code. Industry doesn't seem to be doing that. And the teams in this company remove 85% of the defects prior to system tests, and they only spend less than 10% of the total development time in fixing uh, uh, this the rework time, as opposed to more than 33% in industry. And also, um, this company is able to offer lifetime warranty on the products that they deliver. Uh, so that's something that I think everybody should do. The next few slides I want to show is uh, tracking rework time, and, and we've known for a long time that if you remove defects early in the life cycle, uh, <clears throat> it's less expensive as opposed to later, like in the last stages towards acceptance test and so on. But you don't see very many people actually presenting data to substantiate that. Uh, and this is, an ex this is an attempt to show you our data from 19, the last 19 projects that we have done. And the what we're showing here is the, the, the x-axis is the actual project, uh, so each of those is the project data point. The y-axis is the percent of time spent in that project in reworking defects that were found in inspecting the design. The average of that was 1.45% of the total development time in rework of design inspection. And you see some are zero either because there were maybe no design in that particular project or they didn't find anything wrong. Uh, same thing with code. And this is data on reworking of time as a percent of total development time of uh, defects in, in code inspection, reworking that. It's about 3.7% average. And so you're talking about up to, say, 5% in reworking uh, defect that you find in um, in design and code. And, and, and here's how you get it back. You get it back is now when we finally deliver these things to the customer for acceptance testing, and you can see quite a few points that have zero defects in them. So the average time that is spent in reworking the acceptance test uh, defects is less than 1%. So you spend 5% up front, and you've probably gotten 15, 20% of your development time back. So that's the point I'm trying to illustrate with that. Uh, so, so now let me move on to uh, present to you uh, my list of uh, what I call the immutable laws of software development. The first time I'm presenting this, and I'll dedicate this to Watch Humphrey, who basically said all of these things. I only took the notes as he was doing his talks and working with them over a long period uh, in, around the world. Uh, so that's what these are. Number one, the number of development hours is directly proportional to the size of the software product. The means something that is bigger is going to take longer. Well, as maybe as obvious as it is, there's an implication here, a profound implication, which is that if you don't know precisely and accurately the size of the software product that you're going to build, and and, and translate that into development hours, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be saying vague statements like, well, we don't think this, this, this is too big and we can't deliver it by October 1, 2013. Well, what, what typically happens is the people that came up with an October 1 deadline probably didn't know how long or what, what all they could get by that time frame either. But they said that that's what they wanted and if the, the vendor try to guess and simply say, the well, it's just big and, and cannot come back and substantiate with some real data and conviction defending it, what happens is, which is the second law of software development, 
When acquirers and vendors both guess as to how long a project should take, the acquirer's guess will always win. Which leads to the third, when management compresses schedule arbitrarily, the project will end up taking longer. And then we need to take a look at what happens to the team that's doing the work. And when, when <clears throat> and in fact, if, if we look at the morale of the team on the very first day they start, we can pretty much tell what's going to happen to the project because the team morale is inversely proportional to the arbitrary and unrealistic nature of the schedule imposed on the team. So the more arbitrary, the more unrealistic it is, the more down the team's going to be. But software people, are, they will do the best they can under those circumstances. And so they will run into schedule problems. Schedule problems are normal in even well-managed projects. The only people that can remediate these schedule issues are the team and the members of the team themselves. And when management tries to do something with that, they will make them worse. And let's move on to the impact of poor quality on schedules. And so, so when these people are working against this impossible deadlines and they suddenly get these schedule problems, even if they started doing the work with some pretty good quality practices, they give it up and, and then finally deliver whatever they have by the committed deadline. So essentially what they've done is traded the schedule problem and ended up as a quality disaster. And we just need to take a look at the recent uh, high-profile examples of that, and that's exactly what happened there. And, and, and that, but that's not the first time that's happened either. And we've had those kinds of things um, for the same customer many times, and it happens on the commercial side a lot also, except that maybe we don't quite hear on the commercial side. So the next law is that those that don't learn from poor quality's adverse impact on schedule are doomed to repeat it. And as they say in Kentucky, there is no education in the second kick of a mule. And another law is the less facts you know about a project during development, the more you'll be forced to know later. And uh, so now we're finding out about some projects that didn't go right, and the whole country is now learning a lot about software and projects and what happens and so on. Let's talk about defect injection and removal. Again, a very obvious point, uh, if you spend a lot of time developing, you're going to be injecting a lot of defects. And the reason for that is the work is done by human beings, and we're, we, the error is human, and, and so we will make mistakes. And the issue obviously is, as I had mentioned and shown examples for, is where do you remove them is the key. And so. So if you don't remove a large percent of the defects in before you get into integration system and acceptance test, what you're going to end up is finding a lot of them defects in production use. The converse of that is that the, because you didn't remove a lot of them, you, so this, this point here is about the percent of defects as a percent total number of defects in the product. Here we're talking about the number of defects that you find in integration system and acceptance testing. and what you're going to find in production is going to be directly proportional to the number that you find. This is a very good classic quality control issue, which is if you find a lot of defects, a uh, lot of, yeah, in testing, is it good or bad? So the point here is that if your last steps, in, in if you consider all of the things that we do to remove defects as a series of filtration steps, if the last few filtration steps still end up with a lot of stuff that, that's filtering, and you won't drink a glass of water when the last filter showed that there were a lot of impurities in it, okay, even if it looked clear to you. That's the example there. Uh, so, so the point is that if test is the principal defect removal method, then what you're going to do is you're going to spend a lot of time, money, in your maintenance spend for fixing bugs or corrective maintenance. So when test is the principal defect removal method during development, Corrective maintenance will account for the majority of the maintenance spend. Uh, next one, amount of technical debt is inversely proportional to the length of the agile sprint. And the next one is the earliest predictor of a software project's cost, schedule, and quality outcome is the quality of the development process through code complete. If when it gets beyond the developer into integration system and acceptance testing, if it is not good quality, at the point where the, the uh, code complete time, 
then it's going to have more problems. So we can't predict what's going to happen to it uh, by looking at the process that they use to get the report complete. Management actions based on metrics that are not normalized by size will make the situation worse. And here's a good one. In a 40-hour work week, the number of task hours, this is the hours that an engineer spends in actually doing project work as opposed to going to meetings and being interrupted and so on. So in a 40-hour work week, the number of task hours for each engineer will stay under 20 unless steps are taken to track it and improve it. So we're making commitments based on the fact we think that people are going to be doing 40-hour work week on the projects when, in fact, they don't. Uh, another one is that uh, this happens in many organizations. If the organization says, here's how the work should be done, and the team is thinking that here's what we're doing, and the individuals are actually doing something different, when those three things turn out to be different, then they seem to actually produce really bad outcomes for cost, schedule, and quality. So one thing that we ought to take in mind is that we need to get those to be the same. And my last one is, it's not so much as a law as a definition. Um, you know the definition of insanity. I got a little bit of a different twist on that. It's doing the same thing over and over and firing the project manager or the contractor when you don't get the results you expect. So I think we should apply these, uh, keep these laws in mind as we apply any model, uh, improvement model, to solve these persistent problems. So I'm suggesting seven way forward transformational principles, and I call, I'll call each one of them an outrageous commitment that we need to make uh, to change. And first one is obviously create constancy of purpose and dedication to address the persistent, and I'm calling these wicked problems, uh, which is a whole different issue of classifying problems. I don't have time to get into that. Um, so outrageous commitment number one, and here's two specific things, action items we should do. Both the acquiring community and the contractors make quality the number one goal. It's not enough only contractors make quality the number one goal. The acquisition people need to do the same thing, and it has to come from the very, very top because those are the only people that can make change happen in an organization. And we need to eliminate suboptimal, deliver it now, fix it later uh, solutions. The second thing is restore the individual. Whatever you do in the future, it has to be around the fact that we have people that are capable of doing the work, they're doing quality work, and they're happy on the job. And, but we need to establish the minimum competency for people that are doing this work. They ought to be trained to plan and track their work and manage and measure the quality of what they're doing. Much of the training that they're not getting today in formal uh, classroom education. And we need to quit these annual performance review methods which rank people and do things like rank and yank and all that. Uh, substitute that with self-evaluation and feedback for people that can manage themselves, but provide them coaching assistance, just like you would do in world-class sports and arts and things of that nature. Uh, provide line of sight and explicit cause and effect. Every person in every team should know exactly what they're doing, how it impacts the organization's aim and the actual project team's goals. The next one is uh, end the practice of imposing arbitrary and unrealistic schedules. Start with abolishing arbitrary number of sprints and time-bound releases. Let the team, let the engineers decide how long a sprint should be and how many releases there should be, how the product should be released incrementally. And make sure the engineers are trained to make a plan and, and have the conviction to defend it and support your team where they can actually negotiate an aggressive and realistic schedule as opposed to an arbitrary and unrealistic schedule. So the last point is trust and support your, your team. If your team says the situation is impossible, we don't think we're going to be able to deliver uh, by October 1, 2013, we should pay, pay attention to what they're saying and improve continuously and forever the performance metrics that matter. And, and I've talked about the performance metrics. I'm listing them again here, cost, schedule, deviation, defect density. Uh, I'm putting in percent of reuse, which I think ultimately that's our salvation. But if we start doing it now, we'll be in worse situation because of the poor quality uh, nature of our software development uh, community. Uh, and Think about uh, percent defects removed prior to test, uh, track rework time, uh, cost of quality, and also the other one, last one, process improvement proposals. 
if if you know that your organization is constantly improving the process with the improvements coming from the developers themselves, then I think you have a continuous improvement model. Otherwise, you just have somebody doing something on the, from the process side, and the people, the 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 engineers, still continue to do the work uh, as they always have. Uh, we should quit depending on test and rework cycle for defect removal. And we should promote the practice of putting the highest quality product into test. And software is still built with small components that make up large systems. So we want to make sure that every component, as it goes through downstream testing, is defect free. And we should improve the capability of our teams to predict quality early in the software development lifecycle. In their weekly status report, they ought to be able to say, here's where we're going to be at the end in terms of cost, schedule, and quality. <clears throat> And the last two points are with uh, changing acquisition practices. The first one is let's change from oversight to a culture of continuous improvement based on facts. Uh, let's eliminate the practice of using maturity levels as a pass-fail criteria, like saying that CMMI level three, you ought to be, to be able to bid on the solicitation, things of that nature. And if you're gonna do that, uh, this is self-serving, but make it at least CMMI level five. Uh, in place of appraisals and certifications, uh, measure. Uh, let's start measuring actual true competency, organizational competency, in terms of those performance metrics. And let's eliminate this bureaucratic, non-value-adding uh, monthly status report. In fact, I almost thought I'll put it in there. The second worst idea in software project management is the monthly status report. Uh, and, and require that our teams actually provide precise and accurate status uh, of the performance metrics that matter on a weekly basis. And let's leverage the purchasing power of the acquirer. The acquirer should trust the contractor, but verify with performance metrics that matter. When there is success, celebrate it, reward it, let everybody know we just don't need to be talking about the failures all the time. And acquisition should be based on the lowest price guaranteed quality as opposed to lowest price, technically acceptable, or best value. And you can get there by holding contractors liable for software defects or vulnerabilities. So having said that, those are my uh, recommendations. Let me show, in my way of thinking, how we can reduce the, the, the taxpayer money uh, by, by taking this uh, approach, by looking at this IT spend, the federal IT spend, which is $80 billion a year, and GAO says 70% of that goes to operations and maintenance. Uh, seems to be constant over the last two years there, 30% in development. So if you take the 80 billion and 30% goes to development, that's $24 billion the development spend, and I'm using a 60% scrap and rework number. So really the 24 billion, 14.4 billion is scrap and rework. And similarly, if you take the 70% maintenance spend, which is $56 billion, and we know that the majority of them is going towards, and I'm using a very high number here, 80%, uh, but there are studies that have shown that, is going towards fixing bugs, corrective maintenance, just to keep those just the old systems alive, and that's $44.8 billion for a total of $59.2 billion that is potential saving in a year, which in my way of thinking gives, it adds to 592 billion over a 10 year period and it's just bigger number than any other savings proposal that I've seen that come from a lot of other people. So I think there's a real opportunity here to do that. So that's essentially my talk today and I wanna share this with you from uh, Virginia Woolf's The Waves. And this is the joint work idea that there is a square, there is an oblong, the players take the square and place it upon the oblong they place it very accurately. They make a perfect dwelling place. Very little is left outside. The structure is now visible. What was inchoate is here stated. We're not so various or so mean. We have made oblongs and stood them up on squares. This is our triumph. This is our consolation. So let me leave you with this one thought. What is fun on the job mean to you? And I'll now hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Girish. Um, very excellent presentation. Um, we do have a few questions, but before we do that, we we do want to get a little bit of feedback from the attendees as to um, 
uh, on the on the presentation itself, and so you, you should be seeing a poll, a few polling questions um, up right now. So if you could take a, a moment to answer those three simple questions, we'd appreciate it. Um, uh, I do have a couple of questions, and I, and I encourage others to ask more questions. Um, the first question reminds me that part of when I did the introduction for you, Garish, I forgot to include a, a little bit that you. Uh, you know, you have strategic initiatives at your company, such as agile high-velocity development with guaranteed software quality, including lifetime warranty against software defects. And so one of the uh, attendees asked, uh, what are the key process refinements that you've implemented over PSP and TSP in order to transform AIS uh, software development organization into a high-velocity delivery organization? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, so the, the, what did we do uh, to do that? Essentially, first of all, you start by supporting and trusting your team. And, and because they get in the PSB, they get the education to plan and track their work and measure and manage the work. So in the, the TSB, the team process, the first thing that happens is you launch the project at the very beginning with making sure everybody that's going to work on the project is present as much as possible. You can't do it all the time, but we make sure the whole team is there. They hear from the customer what needs to happen, what's fixed, is uh, cost, schedule, cost, which one is fixed, which one is flexible, and, and with the idea that they will, have to, they will have to come up with a way as to what the customer is asking for, which usually is, I want the product now at zero cost. That's exactly what the customer, the customer start. And we, this method tells the team that, okay, that's fine. And once you know what it is, once you can make a conceptual design of what you're building, you should be able to estimate as best as you can and go back to the, the, the customer saying, well, here's what you wanted, but this is what we think we can do. And so that's the big difference. And, and, and most of the times what we found was when we do that, customers accept that, even though it's not exactly what they wanted, because they now see that there's a team that's actually done the work, and they're very happy with, I mean, they don't want to stick their neck out, and they accept that. So that's the number one. So if you don't start there, none of your process and other methods is going to help you, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. So your high velocity development process is, is based on an agile type of an approach. Is that correct? So, so the agile comes... We, by the way, that's also another good question. We let the teams decide, and, and the, the, the constraints imposed by uh, our management, myself and uh, AI's management, and the customer management is that we want these small scope releases, and we want more releases as opposed to one big bang at the end. And then, but we let the team decide how they're going to handle that and, and come back and present to us before they start the project, saying this is how many releases we're going to have, is what's going to be in each release, and so on. I see. Um, so the, the next question is, let's say you do have to work in an agile manner. How should the team go about providing the infrastructure to test against full-scale production loads? Uh, well, you asked a little bit of a technical question that I wish I had one of my. Is that a technical question to you? Okay, I mean, they're, yeah, they're trying but to. I think I think the, there's no question that we have to do testing, but our emphasis is on doing everything we can to uh, not to rely on the testing as the defect removal method, but like in this big one that uh, that we did uh, where we delivered 600,000 lines of code, we went through a. Uh, a parallel testing to make sure that, uh, and it was modernizing a legacy system, and we want to make sure that the, the new system is producing the same results, and also do some stress testing that that if you're, if you're dealing with databases that have 300 million records in it, can you process and provide subsequent response time and so on, and you do as much of those testing before you go live. I see. I see. Okay. Um, so th those those were the questions that were asked. Um, I I do have a, a, a question or two. Um, you you talked in there about technical debt versus length of the agile spiral. Uh, do do you have any data? Or is there any published data on on this type of th stuff? Um, I'm, I'm just personally debt? curious. Yeah, the technical debt versus the the length of the agile spiral. The, there is one apparently. Uh, I don't know if Don Reifer is on this um, uh, call, call here not or sure. not. He uh, he uh, is 
uh, he's got some data that uh, that I think he hasn't quite published yet, so I don't want to. Uh, oh, okay. Publish it, but but I think he he started a discussion on LinkedIn, saying that what he found was that uh, the of 75 different agile projects in in 10 different countries or so, the first release after the uh, after it went production was all about fixing bugs. And, uh, right. and so that seems to be the norm for many of these Agile projects. And so I think he's now starting to wonder about this whole technical debt question and what it is doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. One of the um, attendees was wondering where you had heard about the two-week sprint as being a requirement because um, they this person felt that the, one of the principles was that the team decides on the sprint length or – have you heard uh, about two weeks as being what people wanted? Uh, well, I think, uh, let me put it this way. I don't know if it's a de jure requirement, but it is It is sort of becoming more of a de facto one. A lot right. of teams, are, a lot of environments are saying, I don't know exactly where or when or who actually says it, but that's how the, the Agile teams, the one I've seen. Understand. Are yeah. Right, right. Okay, okay. All right. Um, Let's see. the the final The final thing is is a, some feedback here, and uh, um, this person thought it was a, a solid presentation. That there are retired uh, Navy commander working in software quality, and found it refreshing to see leadership along with management being discussed. So, um, I, I would uh, I would concur with that. And uh, Garish, I, I I thank you very much for your time and for for giving us this presentation. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, further follow-up um, after the presentation is over. So um, thank you very much, Goresh, and I, and I want to thank everybody for attending. We, have, we had a very large audience today, so I appreciate everybody's uh, time uh, spent at this presentation. Um, uh, thank you again, so. Don, Don. Thanks to you for giving me the opportunity, and uh, thanks to our, uh, our colleagues in AIS. Okay, so, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you again, everybody. And uh, we will we will see you next time, right? <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Bye now.